Well, greetings, everybody. Professor Griffin here again, this time with a video that might be kind of interesting to some of you. This video is what archaeologists really do. And I'm sure a lot of us had an idea about what archaeologists do. But this may surprise you. It may not be what you think. So let's take a look and see what archaeologists really do. Again, I bet a lot of you are curious, or else you already know what they do, or think you know what they do. And let's see if you're right. And then we'll talk a little bit about how they do what they do, because it's a particularly difficult science to explain. And what I'll try to do is make it clearer as we go along. One thing they don't do, and this may surprise you, they don't dig up dinosaurs. If you thought they dug up dinosaurs, or if you want to be someone who digs up dinosaurs, then you wouldn't be an archaeologist you'd be a paleontologist. Because archaeologists dig things up, but they dig things up that have to do with people, human history, things people have created, places they lived. And while some people might think dinosaurs and people lived together on the planet, they didn't. Dinosaurs were gone long before the first people were creating their archaeological sites. So let's take a look at these words, ology, which is on the end of a lot of things like biology and psychology and archaeology, means the study of something, anything, the search for truth and facts and information about a topic. And in the case of archaeology, it means the study of old human evidence. If you want to study dinosaurs, that's paleontology. And you'll never find human evidence and dinosaurs together, except in the ground if they happen to have built a site over the top of hidden fossils. So if you like fossils and you like dinosaurs, you want to be a paleontologist because archaeologists don't really deal with them. So what is an archaeologist? Well, an archaeologist is not someone that deals with fossils and dinosaurs. It's someone that, and also, by the way, it's not Indiana Jones. You may have seen some of those movies where he's fighting his way through snake infested caves. And that's just not what archaeologists usually do. So if you want to be Indiana Jones, you'll have to become an actor and get into movies. But archaeologists are scientists, they're students, they go to college usually for four or five years, maybe six years. Often they get a doctor's degree and they work very hard to understand evidence of human past. Now you might say, look at those bones on the floor though. I thought you said bones were paleontology. Well, these aren't dinosaur bones, even though it may look like a dinosaur site, in fact, here's a paleontology site, not much difference, right? Piles of bones on the ground. But in the site on the right, those are dinosaur bones. And in the site on the left, they're buffalo bones. And this is a butchering site where Indians in the western part of the country butchered buffalo that they hunted. And lots of times, bones that they didn't need to take with them were left there. So that's the difference. This is an archaeology site because it has to do with people. And that's the key. Just remember that if there are people there, it's archaeology. Now let's look at these objects here and kind of think, would an archaeologist dig these up? Let's look at A. Well, that's kind of bony, but the point is it's human bone. It's a burial. And that would be an archaeological site because it's human. B 
stone tools made by humans, not dinosaurs didn't make stone tools. So that would also be an archeological site. C, well, that's a big dinosaur. So we know that's not archeology. span D, broken pottery pieces made by people. Again, human activity. So that's archeology. span E, well, that's a puzzler. And I put that in on purpose to kind of make you think, what is it? it looks like little pieces of stone. We'll come back to that. And F, that's a wall. Well, no dinosaur ever built a wall. This is a Roman wall. It was built by people, so that's archeology. span G is archeology span because that's the remains, the ruins of a village where people lived in the Western United States. And H is what? Fossils. When these fossils fell to the ocean floor, or not when the shells fell to the ocean floor and became fossils, there were no humans around. So that would be paleontology. Now about these little cubes of stone, and they're about the size of a sugar cube that you put in your coffee, what could they be? Well, what they are is pieces of stone that were assembled by the Romans into mosaics. And this is a mosaic and all these little pieces of stones, they had to be the right color that's not painted. These are the colors of the natural stones. They would be put together into a pattern to make a floor and one of the best mosaics you'll ever see is in Sicily at a place called Via Romana del Casale. And this is like a carpet, but you remember, this is a carpet made up of thousands and thousands of tiny pieces of stone. So it took work in a long time. Obviously the person that lived in this house had a lot of money and had people come in and assemble the colored bits of stone to make these beautiful pictures. So if you get a chance to go, or you get a chance either with a school trip or with your family, or when you're older, you can just get on a plane and go yourself. You should go and visit this place. It's really spectacular. Now, a little bit of background on humans. Since archeology span needs humans, you might be interested to know that there were no humans in the Americas before 30,000 years ago. Now, 30,000 years ago, the whole rest of the planet was crawling with humans. And when I say the Americas, I don't mean, you know, America, this country. I mean the continents of the Americas, North America, Central America, and South America. And in fact, anyone that lives in any of these countries could say, I'm an American. And you might be confused thinking, well, you don't live here, but they live in the Americas. So what, people, what kept people from inhabiting the Americas? Well, if you notice here, humans started in Africa and spread through Europe, the Middle East, Asia, even Australia, but they couldn't get to North America because of the Bering Strait. This is a passage of water between Asia or Siberia and Alaska. And a clue is how they did it might be that light shaded water you see. It was shallow water, about 50 feet deep. Now, of course, they couldn't walk across that. And they didn't have boats apparently or couldn't swim that far. But what happened was during an ice age, the Water that evaporates into the air and would come back down as rain or snow came back down as snow, not rain. And the snow piled up in the cold parts of the planet and formed glaciers. And the glaciers, it was so cold they didn't melt. And so what you have is trapped ocean water on land as ice. And when the water is trapped, it, the level fell down below the 50 feet. And the land that was always below the water was now above the water. And so people could get from Asia to North America by walking. Now, how did they manage to do this? And what does it mean for when we talk about the discovery of America. Well, Columbus discovered America, right? 1492. Well, 
Not really. First of all, he didn't come to the country we call America now. He was down in the Caribbean. And people know now that the Vikings came earlier. I think it was around 900 AD, Leif Erikson. Now he really did come to North America. But of course, to say that these Europeans discovered it is wrong because it was already discovered by the Asians who came across the land bridge. So this is what the discovery of America would have looked like. I don't know how you would celebrate that, but it's interesting to know that the people that really discovered America were Asians, not Europeans. And what they were doing is simply following their food. They hunted large game animals and the animals went across the Bering Strait on the land that was exposed and the people followed them. And again, it, you might think on a map you look and it looks like you go way up out of China and way up out of Siberia and then across and then all the way down and through Alaska and Canada. Well, if you were actually on the planet right over the land bridge, it was just a straight path and they didn't realize they were going anywhere special. Now the evidence of all this is hiding under the ground. There are all kinds of processes that cover up archeological sites, flooding, rivers flood, they bring silt, they cover up things, wind, all sorts of, of processes that cause the evidence of these people to be buried. And sometimes it's fairly deep, like the site on the left, those stones down there are part of a prehistoric building. And sometimes it's near, very near the surface. If you're up high, there's not much soil being piled on top of where you lived. And so all of the evidence of where they lived would be just under the grass. And sometimes it's really deep down. Look at this site. This is an archeological site from top to bottom. At the very bottom where that man is sitting, that People live there. Those dark zones are possibly from volcanic activity or forest fires. Something destroyed that village. It got covered up. People came in at the next level up and lived there. You can see those two dark stripes. And then above where that man's yellow hat is, you see some stone. Well, that was a village or city that was built on top of the ruins of what was there before. And at the very top, there's another city that's been built there. Basically, what you've got is like a layer cake. And you've got all of these different civilizations on top of each other, each one covering up and leveling off the ruins of the people that were there before and building up a new city. And then that would collapse. Earthquake, warfare, flooding, whatever the city would be abandoned and new people would come, level it all off and live there. Now take a look at what this process might be like. Here's an English excavation. It's a profile or a cross section of this English site. And what you've got is on the top where the grass is, you've got today's surface. If you went to visit this site, you would walk on that grass and way down at the bottom, is the natural soil that never saw human beings. Maybe it saw dinosaurs, but it's the natural subsoil where people never lived. So that wouldn't be part of their archeological excavation. The next layer would be the Iron Age, 50 BC. These people moved in. And quite often when people move into an area, they level it they to get rid of the big rocks, they move things around and they make it uh, suitable for habitation. And then after that, when they left, the Romans came in and they created their more extensive buildings. You see there's a road, a ditch. Now that Roman ditch on the left, that's a ditch that would define the boundaries of the village. Instead of a fence, they would sometimes dig a ditch around the town. And you can see there's a Roman wall, a Roman floor. And then next came the Saxons. When the Romans left, the Saxons moved in and they built on top. And often they would fill in things and level it off again. They wanted a nice surface to live on. So if there were ruins in the way, they could take care of that. Then the medieval era, 
And here you can see this is a more extensive building. There's a medieval wall. There's a pit that's been dug down. And of course, when you dig down, you encounter these earlier levels. And there's also a medieval house floor. And then above that, an 18th century level. Now, it's not clear what this is. Doesn't look very extensive. Might have just been the outside of a building where they put some cobbles or stones in. And then finally, the 19th century, which was you know, basically the modern period. And they dug down to put in a wall for a building and leveled off the ground. And then you come up to the present. And so that's what these stratified or layered sites would look like in profile, one thing on top of the other. Now, if you're an archeologist and you're studying these people coming from Asia, how would you know where they came from and how they got here and when they did it? Well, these stone tools, these are tools that the people in that time period made. And again, dinosaurs don't make tools, right? So if you find tools, you know people were there. And we also know something about the route they took because here we have gaps in the glaciers. They didn't walk on top of a mile thick of ice. They walked on the ground in between the glaciers where there, for one reason or another, was a break. And if you find a site like this, this is a aerial picture of Alaska. And you can see the Upward Sun River site where they found stone tools. So they know the people coming over the land bridge at some point stopped there and excavate, they excavated this site and they found tools. Now that those things that look like walls are just the, the balks or walls between squares so they can see what the levels look like. They weren't walls that the people built when they came across the bridge. Now, when, again, you know, we know that the tools made at different times look different. These are tools from Siberia and very similar tools are found in North America. At this time, for some reason, later tools didn't look as fine as these. Their technology deteriorated. So how do we date tools? Well, we, you can't date stone. Stone is stone, right? This is a layer of flint that in a flint mine used by prehistoric people. And they dig out these chunks and they're very good for making tools. But the stone itself is a million years old. So the people weren't that old. So how do we tell from a stone tool how old it is? You can't date the stone. You have to somehow date the human activity that turned the stone into a tool. And how do you turn a rock into a tool? Well, I'll tell you, there are lots of interesting videos on YouTube that can show you people today doing exactly the same thing that people did thousands of years ago, turning flint rocks into tools. And I'll try to put one of these up on my channel but you can just go to YouTube and search for flint napping. Now watch the spelling of that because flint is the stone and napping is the process of making it into something. And it's K-N-A-P-P-I-N-G. So you have to spell it right or who knows what you'll get. But you can watch people in the modern time make beautiful stone tools the same way people did thousands of years ago. Now be careful. Don't get the idea, I mean, it looks like fun, but don't get the idea that you can go out and make your own stone tools. Especially if you're using flint, the chips are as sharp as a razor blade. And also the process of chipping them, you might get a piece in your eye, you can cut your finger. So I don't recommend anybody try making their own stone tools at least until you become trained, you're wearing heavy gloves, you've got safety glasses on, okay? Like I say, these, these flakes, when they're chipped off the main stone, are very sharp. 
Now, interestingly, if you use the, you, you might say, well, why make a stone tool if the flakes are sharp? Use those to cut up the meat. Use those to cut the bark. Well, this is what a sharp flake looks like after it's been used. You see, it's got a lot of little chips out of it. It's getting dull. So what they would do is they would resharpen it along that edge. And this is a stone. It may look like a spear point, but it's really, a, I think it's actually a knife. And you can see that it looks like it has little teeth on it. And if you've ever used a serrated knife to cut meat, you know it's a lot better than a straight edge knife. And so the tools were often chipped into that form to make it easier to use them. And if they got dull, they'd sharpen them up again the same way. So how do you tell how old stone tools are? If the stone is a million years old, how do you figure out when they were made? We have to look at the process that was used and the people who did it and when they lived, when they were actually doing this work. The tool itself can be instructive as far as when it was made, but the point is you really have to be careful not to try to tell how old the stone itself is. And we do this by association. Association is just when two things are found together it tells you something. So if you know someone's been taking your candy and you know you bought uh, gummy bears and they keep disappearing and then you go to your brother's room and you look in his drawer and there's gummy bears or wrappers or something, you'd say, okay, that suggests that my brother took my candy because they're associated together. So thing A, in this case, stone tools, and thing B, in this case, the charcoal from the fire pit or the bones from this animal, you can tell how old that is. <coughs> Carbon-14 dating. I won't go into the explanation. You can look it up. But what it means is that when you test a living, the remains of a living thing, Charcoal is the remains of a tree. Bone is the remains of an animal. <clears throat> you can tell how long it's been dead. So if they cut a tree and they made a fire and the bits of charcoal can be dated and these projectile points or arrowheads were found near that fire pit then you'd say that's when they were made. Association. You have to be very careful that you really are associating the things with the artifacts. So they can't be too far away. They can't be too far up in the soil. They can't be too far down. They have to be very close to the level that these datable things are in. It's like detective work. Evidence. And so by getting evidence, you end up being able to date the tools. You're dating the charcoal, but the tool that's near the charcoal had to be there at the same time. So you date when the tree died, when they chopped it down, put it in the fire. And that tells you when the artifact was made. Now, what if there's nothing to date? Remember, you need organic material, wood or bone or something to date. But if there isn't anything, and all you have are stone tools, that's it. You look at them, you can stare at them all day. It won't show you how old they are. Well, there's two ways, absolute and relative dating. And I thought when I made this slideshow, I said, gee, this is gonna be, it's gonna be a little bit complicated. Maybe, you know, kids won't really wanna get into this. But I gave this on Zoom one time and there was a 13 year old girl and she knew what this was before I could even explain it. 
she knew exactly what it meant. So let's pretend we all knew too. And now I'll explain it. Just don't tell anybody you didn't know until I explained it. Absolute dating means the date you get that is beyond doubt because of the association of something that's dateable with the thing. So here you have some kids and they all have their birth certificates. And so we know absolutely when they were born. That's what a birth certificate tells you. So if you know when they're born, you know how old they are. So there's no question, it's not difficult if you have that absolute dating, just like the charcoal. If you know how old the charcoal is and the tool was in or with the charcoal, that's absolute dating. Okay, got that. I don't hear anybody complaining, so. But what's relative dating? Relative means that one thing compared to something else. Well, we know that the little people are young, the middle-sized people are older than the little people, and the bigger people are the oldest. They don't have their birth certificates, and we don't know exactly how old they are, but we know the order they go in, young, older, oldest. And we can do the same thing with things we find in the ground. You see this site over here on the left, see those layers? Those are the different layers that people lived on at different times in the past. And even if we didn't have any charcoal, we'd know that the lowest ones, the artifact in the lowest level was the oldest, the middle level, was not as old and the top one was not as old as the middle because the soil builds up from down at the bottom to up at the top. That's relative dating. So you can begin to create a sequence using stratigraphy. Stratigraphy means the strata or the layers, like a layer cake. So the ground is has layers in it. You know the oldest is the lowest and things found in there can be put in to a sequence, okay? A sequence from bottom to top. We, we can do that because we know how soil accumulates from bottom to top. You can also, also use typology. Typology means the type a thing is. And what happens is that artifacts in society Every, every culture, every society has the same basic laws of, of change. They change across the culture in the same kind of way, like those, those cars, okay? You, you can look at those and you immediately know which is the old car and which is the new car. And you can know that in 1955 or whenever when the, that Hetzel was built on the left, almost everybody in the country was driving a car that looked something like that. And when this new car over here is showing up in Chicago, you know, you can find the same car in California, in Maine. So some things change a lot. And some things don't change much. Men's clothes, for one thing. I don't know why women's clothes change a lot, but men's clothes don't. And some things don't seem to change at all. Look at those axes that Axe on the left is from 1850. The axe on the right is from yesterday. So if you found that axe head, the handle rotted away and you found the axe head, how would you tell how old it was? Well, hopefully there'd be a mark on it or something saying who made it and you could trace the company. Same thing here. I think I have these backwards. Maybe I meant to have them backwards. Telephone A, when was that made? Well, we can tell it was made in 2020 because that's the kind of telephone people have. B, I used to have one of those, flip phone. Let's say this in the middle. And that 
was, if you can believe it, C is the type of mobile phone people used to have not too long ago. Things big. So if we know what kinds of phones people use and we find something like that in the ground, we can date it. And that's called typological dating. And here's a section of a typology. A typology is like a book where you can look up the dates of different types of artifacts. And of course, the dating comes from not only the sequence in the ground, but it comes from charcoal dating as well. So we know that, in fact, the bottom uh, projectile point, we call them projectile points because they weren't on arrowheads, belongs to like 11,000 BP. And the one up at the top is closer to 1,000. We know that because of years and decades and decades of excavation that gave us the evidence of association. Now, if we didn't have association, you couldn't tell when these things were made. You have to have something with a real date attached to it to date them. Now, our knowledge depends on excavation, but excavation isn't just taking a shovel and digging a hole. You know, it might seem like fun to go in the backyard and, with a shovel and just dig a big hole and see if you find an arrowhead. But what do you really know then? Well, you've, it's like, it would be like going into um, a book and, you know, taking out a picture and then giving the picture to somebody and say, look what I found. And they'd say, yeah, what about it? And you say, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to get the book out and find out where it came from. So what you're doing, if you just dig up a, an artifact, what you're doing is taking like the pictures out of a book and leaving the words in the ground and you can't explain what's going on. So excavation has to be done very carefully. And really what you're doing is you're destroying the site. I mean, obviously if you dig through all that dirt and throw the dirt in a pile somewhere and take all the material you find away, the site is gone. So how do we preserve what was there. It's a three-dimensional thing, an archaeological site. It has a, a up and down part and it has a sideways part. And so we record it in three dimensions. Now we use a grid. Remember these activity books where you have to redraw the elephant in bigger squares? So you're just trying to take the squares from the original and create a copy. And that's what we're doing with archaeological recording. There's as much paperwork involved in digging a site as there is digging. And here's a grid. Now this grid is put over the excavated square after they finished that level so they could map everything. But the whole site is a grid anyway as well because the entire site is divided up into squares and those squares can be mapped at a different scale on graph paper. This is an excavation of a village. And those orange dot patterns are where posts were driven in the ground for houses. And the black outline is the stockade. And it would have looked something like this before it rotted away. And so what you're doing by recording everything on a grid is you're preserving what the site was like when the site is no longer there. Now this looks like a funny grid, but again, remember I talked about the walls on that site in Alaska? This is basically a balk system. Balks are the thick walls left between squares. So everybody, each team has been assigned a square, they're working on it. And you leave the box up because that shows the layers that were around that square. And you want to keep that evidence as long as you can. It's like a cardboard box. When you're done, you've got an empty box. And what you need to do is record all the inside faces, the bottom, each side, and preserve it on graph paper. So you can go back and say, well, in this square, we had this funny thing that came down as yellow soil, and then we had charcoal over. And, and the empty box now is preserved on paper. 
Now, this is an interesting site because these patterns look kind of uh, regular. I've worked on a couple sites like this. And it's an Iroquois site. And these are houses, house patterns. And you can see that those two archaeologists there are working with something called a plumb bob. And that's a carpenter's tool or a house builder's tool. And because of its weight, it goes straight down. So what you do to find out where something is on the floor relative to your grid is you hold it up and hold it over the thing on the floor and where your hand comes up to the grid, then you put that on the graph paper. So what is this site about? Well, it's post molds. Those black dots are post molds. And they're great evidence. And, and if you remember what I said, you don't just dig a hole in the ground. Those little bits of stained ground would be extremely hard to see if you weren't careful. And here you can see it's where a post is driven in. And look at all the posts in this Iroquois village. Posts for the houses, posts for the stockade. And you see in, them, in the lower left of that site map, you see those two lines of dots? That's the post molds for the stockade. And here's, it may be hard to see, but here's a line of four post molds. A little bit darker soil. What happens is the wood rots away and the organic material darkens the soil. And when you scrape it down, you see where those posts once were, even though there's no wood left. And you have to cross section these post molds because rodents can make holes in the ground, the same size around. But if they come to a point, that's the base of a post. So every single stain has to be cross-sectioned. That's a kind of obvious stockade post. That's a very large post. But they were sharpened and driven into the ground. And what kind of structure do you think this is? What are we looking at? Think about it for a second. Big fat posts and all close together. It's a stockade. Stockade was a wall built to protect a community or a fort. And all of those posts driven in the ground when they rotted left these dark circles. Here's a stockade around what was the first settlement of English people. Jamestown. So this place is crawling with posts because you have a stockade and every single building in there is creating some kind of a subsurface wooden imprint that later will be a stain. And here's the recreation from just from the excavation. They had a few drawings, but the drawings weren't very accurate. But this is the recreation of what that fort looked like. And here's what they found out. This is the map of the actual shoreline of the river today. And you'll notice that it proves, based on the lines that they've got going toward the water, that at least one of the bastions of the fort has been washed away by the river, and the other one is starting to be washed away. So the importance of a grid, and here's a grid of squares, the excavated squares, is that it allows you to put everything you find on graph paper. These look like, uh, they look like five foot squares that, you know, now they work in meters a lot, but it looks like a five foot square. And usually two people would work in that. But there's other kinds of archeology span if you're interested in archaeology, you don't have to go work in the dirt. There's underwater archaeology. This is a new field that's become especially good because of technology. Now the ability to map and find underwater cultural sites is many times greater than it was even 10 years ago. So if you like diving and you're interested in shipwrecks and maybe even lost cities, 
you do that. Historical archaeology, you don't have to dig a hole. You could just go out and map ruins, um, especially in the jungle. If you like snakes and spiders, you go ahead. And this is a great type of archaeology, which I really like because uh, my ancestors came from England and this is a scene in England from an airplane. And you see all those lines, those are all patterns of an ancient town. <clears throat> those long parallel lines on the right, those are furrows in a field. That's how they used to plow the fields. They would plow them in long lines like that, ridge and furrow agriculture. You can see way at the top of that picture, some more of it. You can see roads and lanes that come in where buildings used to be. And sometimes this is based on shadow. This is done late in the day. But sometimes if you go out in the spring, you can see darker areas of vegetation coming up. And this is usually because there's something underneath that's changing the nutrition to the roots or the moisture in the ground. So that's a great one. Here, look at, here's one that I was just, just talking about that. Do you see all those circles? Those are Iron Age buildings. And they show up because of the walls underneath the ground, creating a different moisture environment. And so the plants grow differently and they show up as dark squares and circles. And then of course you can go out there and dig to prove that it's there. But this is interesting because if you didn't have aerial photography, lots of times you wouldn't be able to see these things on the ground because you're so close to it. And this is the most exciting thing and it's only been in the last few years. This is called LIDAR and it's a type of radar. And what it does better than radar is it sees through the trees. This is in a jungle but you don't see any jungle there, do you? And that's because the, the, the radar in this technology bounces through the trees and off the stone features and off the ground. And it gives you a picture of what's under there. And this is probably what you would see if you strip away the vegetation. It's a Mayan ruin in Central America. And this is the closest thing to Superman's x-ray vision you'll ever get because it sees through things and it really does. There is no such thing as x-ray vision, but there's LIDAR, which does the same thing. So if you could stick a LIDAR set inside your head, I suppose you'd have x-ray vision. And this is the difference. Same, this is the same land on the left is what you'd see if you were flying over in an airplane, just looking. And on the right is the LIDAR image of the exact same spot. And you can see there's a Mayan ruin there, temples, plaza. Very exciting. So you can see there's a lot of non-digging archeology span that can be done because of technology. Now, if you like archaeology or you still like it after this presentation, I suggest you try to get onto um, some streaming site or even just go to Google. I mean, I mean uh, sorry, go to YouTube and look up Time Team. That's the word, the name of the program, Time Team. And they've got lots of shows on there showing archaeologists, mostly in England, but I think there's an American version. Or say, I should say United States version. But you go on there and you check it out. And the interesting thing is these teams are given three days to excavate a site. Now, nobody excavates a site reasonably in three days, but they're given this challenge. See if you can find out what this is about in three days. And it'll really show you some of the things that archaeologists are doing. And I really suggest it's, it's a great program to watch. Now, just a, a thought to leave you with. When we were kids, we always said finders, keepers, losers, weepers. 
Well, maybe that's true if somebody dropped some money. And I don't think it's even true there. If you find a wallet on the street, you have to turn it over to the police. And if you wait like, I don't know, 30 days and nobody claims it, then you can have it. But you can't just stuff it in your pocket. Well, with archaeology, it's the same thing. You know, there's, especially underwater archaeology, there's a lot of divers go down there. They find cannonballs and gold coins and, and you know, stuff, and they just take it. Well, that's not true. The law is that things, archaeological things on or in the ground belong to the landowner. And you might say, well, what landowner is the bottom of the ocean? Well, every body of water belongs to some jurisdiction. It might be a country. It might even be a state. Like if you go into the Hudson River here in New York State and you find something, it belongs to the people of New York. In other words, we all own that and we don't want somebody taking it in their garage. So we think about this. I may do a video on this later. If you're interested, you know, let me know. Leave a comment on my channel. I haven't had a comment yet, so you can be the first. Okay, this is a production, chuckle, chuckle, of Bandersnatch Studios. And... Um, Bandersnatch is kind of an evil beast from Alice in Wonderland. And I'm the, I'm the good character. I'm the, I'm the um, Griffin from Alice in Wonderland. But, you know, a little comedy never hurt anybody. Just don't, this guy bites, so don't get near him. And the legal company of Griffin, Bandersnatch, and Hatter, ha uh -huh, created this media. And I hope you've enjoyed it because if you have, I hope you'll let me know and hit the like button, subscribe, because I got a lot more of these great, pardon the expression, media pieces coming down the tube. So subscribe and then perhaps they can be yours. Now, this is something that's supposed to be fixed up to represent <clears throat> an appeal for subscriptions and things, but it hasn't been finished yet. So just pardon me while I stare at you with my evil eye. Okay, well, I'm glad you joined me. I hope some of you will be archaeologists. And please let me know what you think. And you can just contact me with questions about archaeology if I haven't answered them. Okay. Thanks for watching.